Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is David Claremont. I teach in the theology department here at Notre Dame in the area of religious ethics, and it's uh, my pleasure to convene uh, this panel this morning. Uh, our session this morning includes uh, papers by three graduate students um, from theology programs around the country, and I'll introduce the three of them uh, first before they make their presentations. Um, on your right, uh, Daniel Castillo is a doctoral candidate in systematic theology at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he's interested in the intersection between liberation theologies and ecological theology, and his dissertation explores the potential uh, of the thought of Gustavo Gutierrez for, formulate, for formulating an ecological theology of liberation. Daniel is also a fellow in Notre Dame's GLOBES program, which is an interdisciplinary program that explores uh, links between biology, environment, and society. Uh, sitting next to Dan uh, is Elizabeth Pine, who is a doctoral student in systematic theology at Fordham University. Her research explores the intersection of theological anthropology and ecological theology, particularly in conversation with contemporary gender and critical theory. Sitting next to Elizabeth is Matthew Whalen, who's currently a doctoral candidate in the graduate program in religious studies at Duke University. His dissertation focuses on uh, Catholic teaching on land and agriculture, particularly the repeated call for agrarian reform. The topic of our session this morning, you're up here in your slide, is climate change, catastrophe, and the Catholic imagination. Uh, within this framework, each of our presenters will focus on a distinct dimension of the Catholic imagination. Daniel will present first and will explore notions of lament and repentance. Elizabeth uh, will give the following presentation and consider the theme of discipleship in Christ. Matthew will conclude the session by examining the theme of Christian hope. Um, because of the time constraints, uh, we'll not have a formal question and answer period at the end of this session. However, uh, during lunch, the three panelists uh, have informed me that they'll be uh, sitting together and uh, would welcome to, um, uh, to continue conversation with you about the themes of the conference. So thank you all again for being with us, and I'll now turn the session over to Daniel. Good morning. The title of my presentation is Climate Change, Mourning and Repentance in the Catholic Imagination. I would like to begin my paper with a brief passage from the, prof from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. It reads, I have seen the earth, and here in this place it is wildness and waste. And I look to the heavens, and their light is gone. I have seen the mountains, and here they are wavering, and all the hills palpitate. I have seen, and here there is no human being, and all the birds of the heavens have fled. I have seen, and here the garden land is now a wasteland, and all its cities are pulled down. Discussion regarding climate change today tends to emphasize the unprecedented scope of the social and ecological upheaval that the world now faces. To be sure, there is good reason to highlight the singularity of this situation in human history. However, as the passage from Jeremiah indicates, this is not the first time in the life of the church that the people of God have been threatened with catastrophe. For example, many of the Christian communities in Augustine's time would have experienced the sacking of Rome as an event of radical decimation. Indeed, one can note that the apostles likely perceived the crucifixion of Jesus in a similar manner. In cases such as these, it would have appeared in a very real sense that the world was being threatened with dissolution. 
Therefore, as the contemporary church considers how it is called to respond to the realities of climate change, it would do well to examine the Christian tradition, scrutinizing the manner in which the people of God, the church, have understood their relationship to God in the midst of previous experiences of decimation. This examination should be carried out for the purpose of discerning how these earlier responses might shape the imagination and the praxis of the church today, informing the church as to how it might best realize its vocation to be a sacrament of salvation for the world at a time when the world must confront the potentially catastrophic effects of anthropogenic climate change. In this paper, I will undertake such an examination, albeit a brief one, by drawing our attention to several parallels between our situation today with respect to climate change and the experience of Judah at the exile in 587 BCE, perhaps the most catastrophic event in the Old Testament and the context in which Jeremiah's ministry took place. My purpose here is to elucidate how the prophetic imagination that was active in Judah in the time leading up and during the exile can, afford, can inform the thought and action of the contemporary church. In particular, drawing on the work of the biblical theologian Walter Brueggemann, I will argue that a moment of prophetic lamentation is essential to the church's public and political response to the pressing realities of climate change. I will assume throughout my argument that this moment of lament should be focused not only on the potentially devastating effects of climate change, but also on the manner in which human sinfulness has shaped our current context. As I begin my argument, I will uh, first consider in closer detail our current situation with respect to climate change so that when I do turn to Brueggemann, the similarities between our historical moment and that of Judah at the dawn of the exile will become clear. So seeing our world today, as I noted at the outset, we live in a world that is facing unprecedented societal and ecological destabilization via the effects of anthropogenic climate change. To many educated observers, it appears that if human society continues on its current trajectory, the probable effects of climate change should be couched in catastrophic, if not apocalyptic terms. Indeed, the work of the noted environmental scientist Johan Rockström suggests that given the non-linear non manner in which the dynamics of the Earth system function, and given the multiple boundaries of the Earth system that are currently being transgressed, the collapse of human society at a global level is becoming an increasingly real possibility. In view of this, numerous atmospheric scientists have warned against adopting a quote unquote business as usual model with respect to economics and politics for addressing climate change. As Paul Crutch and Will Steffen and their colleagues point out, while a business as usual model approach normally is thought of as conservative, in this case such an approach appears increasingly reckless. In view of the risk portended by climate change, a safer approach would actually be one which is proactive in reconfiguring the structures of society. And yet, as the failures of numerous international summits on climate change indicates, indicate, the business as usual model continues to be the overriding response. Now the reasons why this model remains regnant are, are complex. Here I would like to focus briefly on the ideological dimensions underlying this stasis by turning to the work of the sociologist Leslie Sclair. In his work, Sclair seeks to provide, provide an account of the structural and ideological dynamics of the global system, what he labels global capitalism. According to Sclair, globalization should be understood as a distinct moment in economic and political history one that is marked structurally by the rise of transnational corporations, as well as by the advent of what he terms the transnational capitalist class. While it is outside the parameters of this paper to examine these categories in any detail, 
it must be observed that Scler locates the roots of the ecological crisis within the structural elements of the global system. In other words, it is the global economy informed by a logic of continuous growth that is the primary driver of climate change. Having acknowledged this point, it is actually the third dimension of Scler's analysis of, the glo of global capitalism that is most pertinent to my paper here. According to Scler, the structures of the global system are relying upon the spread of what he terms, quote, the cultural ideology of consumerism, end quote. And it is to this cultural ideology that I would like to explore uh, now. In describing the cultural ideology of consumerism, Scler asserts that the dramatic growth in advertising and communications technologies over the last century have allowed transnational corporations to create and promulgate the fictive persona of the consumer as the ideal person. In describing this persona, Scler writes, quote, the cultural ideology of consumerism proclaims literally that the meaning of life is to be found in the things that we possess. To consume, therefore, is to be fully alive, and to remain fully alive, we must consume." End quote. Moreover, he argues that today the cultural ideology of consumerism has become virtually hegemonic, colonizing the life world of any society tied to the global economy. The fictive persona of the consuming person, then, appears to be on the verge of becoming an unrivaled global ideal. Importantly, Scler observes that the ideal of person as consumer is essential to the life of global capitalism. This is because the functioning of the system is predicated upon the continuous accumulation of capital, and it is the act of consumption that drives the process of accumulation. Thus he comments, quote, without consumerism, the rationale for continuous capitalist accumulation dissolves, end quote. In other words, the cultural ideology of consumerism is the glue that holds the system together. For my analysis here, it is also vital to note that Scler detects an implicit faith in progress built into the cultural ideology of the global system. According to this worldview, the act of consumption not only promises the good life, it also promises an increasingly better life. Here, faith and progress is tied most strongly to the innovative items and technologies that are created and consumed. However, this faith also extends to human ingenuity in general. Thus, one finds that those who have been socialized within the cultural ideology of consumerism maintain a belief when faced with the apparent threats of climate change that human ingenuity will be able to adequately remedy these threats. In order to understand the dangers inherent in uncritical faith and progress, which in turn will allow us to see more clearly why the business as usual approach remains regnant, it is helpful to turn to the thought of the theologian Johann Baptist Metz. At the dawn of postmodernity, Metz argued that a false metaphysics of progress still colored the collective imagination of the West. As he saw so perceptively, this ideology of progress engenders a mode of existence for the human person which relieves her of the responsibility to act. Among the reasons that this is so is that under the influence of this ideology, political and ethical life have been eclipsed by technical reason and a faith that efficiency and market logic will produce the best of possible worlds. Thus, the human person need only go along with the formulae of the planners. Metz, there, there, Metz therefore finds that the cult of progress which affirms humanity's omnipotence in its ability to manage its own destiny ultimately gives way to a cult of apathy and to the apolitical life. Accordingly, 
Metz sums up the spirit of the contemporary society by quoting Bertolt Brecht, writing, quote, when atrocities happen, it's like when the rain falls. No one shouts, stop it anymore, end quote. This, it seems to me, continues to capture the zeitgeist of our situation today. Under the influence of the cultural ideology of consumerism, we have been able to ignore the ethical and political imperatives that climate change presents to us as a global society. As a result, business as usual continues. No one shouts stop it anymore. At this point, a brief summary of my foregoing argument will be helpful before shifting to the exile. Thus far, I have asserted that our contemporary situation with respect to climate change is such that a break from the business as usual approach to politics and economics appears necessary. At the same time, such a break has proven to be elusive. A key reason for this elusiveness is the fact that human beings are increasingly beholden to the cultural ideology of consumerism. This cultural ideology leads us to direct our energies towards consumption as the means of expressing the fullness of our humanity. It leads us to affirm a faith in progress that vitiates any imperative for ethical or political action. And at the same time, it continues to fuel the very structures and mechanisms that are at the root of anthropogenic climate change. It seems to me that this situation there's a striking formal resemblance to the socio-political atmosphere in Judah on the eve of the exile. As Walter Brueggemann describes it, in the years leading up to the exile, Judah had truly become a nation like other nations. Under the, monarchies, uh, under the monarchy, Judah's programs of governance came to approximate the type of imperial regime from which God had delivered the Hebrews through the exodus. As such, the monarchy of Judah maintained and expanded its wealth and power through the exploitation of the poor and the abuse of the land. At the same time, the monarchy gave rise to an ideology that sanctioned Judah's exploitative power arrangements. According to Brueggemann, this ideology, which he dubs the royal consciousness, maintained that the socio-political order established by Judah was in fact a divine order. Thus, the royal consciousness permitted no talk of alternatives. One's only option was to bow down to the wisdom of the monarchy. Importantly, Brueggemann observes that in sanctioning the status quo, the royal consciousness led people to numbness, especially to numbness about death. This is because in order to affirm the exploitative regime of the monarchy, one must become desensitized to the deaths and sufferings upon which the monarchy was built. It is this culture of numbness and denial endemic to the royal consciousness that allows the monarchy to maintain its claims of legitimacy. Since there is an, a denial of unjust suffering and of sin, there is no impetus for change. Nothing new need come about in history. Or in other terms, since no one shouts stop it anymore, the business as usual model can persist. The exile, of course, shatters the monarchy's presumption. And tellingly, Brueggemann observes that when the exile does occur, when Judah is cast off its land because of its sins, when its social order is decimated, when it appears that, as Brueggemann puts it, history is over, the royal consciousness has nothing to offer. Since this ideology was so deeply interwoven with the maintenance of the dominant order, when the dominant order collapses, the royal consciousness cannot imagine something new emerging. It cannot find reason to hope. Instead, it can only give itself over from denial to despair. It is in these times of pending and realized catastrophe 
times in which the royal consciousness was rendered impotent, that Brueggemann observes Judah coming to rely upon the vision and imaginations of its prophets. Within the alternating situations of seemingly timeless hegemony, be it monarchy or global capitalism, and ruin, the exile, the threats of climate change, it is the prophet who has the ability to see the most fearful aspects of reality, and within this view, imagine a new way of being and a new future. Thus, the prophetic imagination has at its disposal the power to counter the royal consciousness. Indeed, both in times of the status quo and in times of radical destabilization, it is the prophet who calls the people of God, and indeed the whole world, to repentance. In view of our current situation with respect to climate change and the cultural ideology of consumerism, I would suggest that an especially important task for the church today is the cultivation of its prophetic imagination. In appealing to the need for the prophetic within our present day context, however, my claim here is somewhat more specific. In particular, I believe that it is the prophetic task of lament that must be fostered with greatest urgency in the church today. As Brueggemann observes, an essential task of the prophet was to express the pathos that had been collectively denied by a culture under the influence of the royal consciousness. And in so doing, make present symbols of lament within the public and political spheres, symbols that are able to adequately capture the terror of current and future realities, symbols that, when presented rightly, lead us to mourn. The question that we must ask here, then, is this. Why grief? What is the purpose of embracing or even cultivating lament? To these questions, Brueggemann suggests that the numbness, denial, and despair fostered by the royal consciousness can only be broken by, quote, the embrace of negativity and by the public articulation that we are fearful and ashamed of the future we have chosen, end quote. Lament, in other words, the task of mourning, is the work that permits the person or community to see reality in all of its darkness and not over be overcome by that reality. Lament, then, is the praxis which allows one to break through the cycle of denial and despair, thus permitting one to the possibilities of conversion, consolation, and hope to emerge. Brueggemann's arguments find support in the contemporary work of systems theorist and psychoanalyst Joanna Macy. Macy, who is also a professor at the Graduate Theological Union of Berkeley, has worked at length with individuals and communities in uncovering and working through their latent environmental despair and guilt. Macy has observed that this despair, when not confronted, tends to hold the person or community captive, vitiating one's ability to respond to the crisis in meaningful ways. When the information that we have regarding climate change is not met with corresponding grief, Macy argues, persons tend to be driven into deeper denial and become over, even more overwhelmed by a sense of futility. Simply put, information alone is not enough. However, in her practice, Macy has found that through honest and painful lament, through what she describes as the spare work, the person or community can find not only the power to confront the realities of ecological and social devastation, the person or community can also uncover the generative power that allows one to imagine a new future, and in so doing, enter into deeper forms of solidarity with the world. One such form of solidarity, I would suggest, is political action through the formation of social movements around the issue of climate change. It appears then, amidst the specter of anthropogenic sin and its effects, and within the seemingly universal cultural ideology of consumerism, the church 
if it is to realize its vocation as a sacrament of salvation, must become a site of mourning, or in Macy's terms, a conduit of despair work. The church, no doubt, has within its resources symbols that are powerful enough to unveil the terrors with which the world is now threatened. A pressing task, then, is to cultivate a prophetic consciousness around these symbols with respect to climate change, so as to help the people of God mourn, so that in turn they might be they might bear the weight of reality and dare to hope and imagine and enact a new way forward. Within the Catholic imagination, such a conversion, as is the case with all forms of conversion, necessarily must be understood in reference to Christ. With this in mind, I will turn our session over to my colleague, Elizabeth Pine. Thank you. Good morning. Is that good? The title of my paper today is Bearing the Weight of Salvation, a Liberative Christology in the Face of Climate Change. I want to thank Dan for so clearly bringing into focus for us this powerful reading of Israel's prophetic tradition as one which, in its naming and mobilization of mourning, stands to inform our church's response to climate change today. Indeed, as he mentioned, a Christian theology will go on to develop its reflections in light of the belief that a concentrated vision of that prophetic imagination dwelt among us in Jesus of Nazareth, whom Christians proclaim as Christ, and whose business, we know, was anything but business as usual. To reflect on Christ is to move into the ambit of sin, grace, and salvation, and in this, to encounter more deeply the will of God in history. Dan has outlined an important orientation for Christians facing climate change by claiming that the conversion to a liberating hope must be rooted in repentance for sin. For the prophetic task of preaching sin was always paired with the preaching of promise, namely the reign of God, that future vision of shalom where the created world is healed, brought to peace, and made whole. What does it mean then for Christians animated by a prophetic consciousness to turn to Christ as savior, as, as embodiment of flesh fulfilled in light of the ever more apparent reality of climate change? Without proposing a comprehensive ecological Christology, I hope today to lift up some markers of one possible response as I offer a reading of Christology informed by Latin American liberation theologian, Ignacio Eacuria. Michael Lee, a Fordham professor and Fordham, uh, pardon me, Notre Dame graduate, focuses his excellent study of Ea Korea on soteriology, or how this theologian understands salvation, precisely the question before us today. It is the title of his book, Bearing the Weight of Salvation, that I have borrowed from my paper, and it is the vision of Christ therein that I want to suggest provides an invigorating res uh, resource to confront the problem of anthropogenic climate change. Following Michael Lee's insights on the relationship of soteriology to discipleship in Ea Korea's thought, I will argue that a Christian praxis which entails commitment to stemming and perhaps even reversing the grievous effects of our atmospheric misdeeds is neither external nor incidental to a faith that proclaims salvation in Christ. To the contrary, we return to what is central and imperative in the mission of the church. To begin, I would like to say just a few words about our theological guide, because as Lee attests, quote, in Ea Korea, one possesses not just an intellectual account of Christian discipleship, but a martyrial performance, a lived testimony that connects intrinsically to his intellectual output, end quote. Born in 1930 in the Basque region of Spain, Ea Correa joined the Jesuits in 1947 and was commissioned the following year to El Salvador, where he eventually became a naturalized citizen. As a scholar and later rector of the University of Central America in San Salvador, 
he worked tirelessly to bring together Christian faith and a searing socio-political analysis of the national reality, especially the plight of its suffering poor. He labored along with other Jesuits during El Salvador's civil war to negotiate a peace settlement, while finding himself in increasingly tense and hostile relations with an oligarchic regime and its military forces, which were responsible for the killing, torture, and disappearing of tens of thousands or more people. On November 16, 1989, Ea Correa was assassinated along with seven others, five Jesuits, their housekeeper, and her daughter, on the grounds of the university. With this striking biographical witness in mind, we can turn to his writings. For those unfamiliar with his work, let it be said, his is a difficult and philosophically dense theology, but I believe it amply rewards those who journey with it and will be worth our time this morning to explore a couple of key, key concepts. Before approaching Ea Korea's Christology proper, we do well to delve into what Lee terms his principle and foundation. Here Lee is referring to the sequence of the Ignatian spiritual exercises in their preliminary considerations of the universe's meaning and purpose insofar as it is suffused with the grace of a loving creator. For Ea Korea, this is best captured by the notion of human existence as historical reality an admittedly nondescript sounding phrase, but one that in fact packs a philosophical and theological punch. Its roots are found in the work of two of Ea Correa's teachers, his mentor, Xavier Zubiri, and the German Jesuit, Karl Rahner. Zubiri sought to overcome philosophical dualism, such as that between mind and body, showing instead how ideas are enme enmeshed in a complex and dynamic realm of action, a reality that is biological, social, and historical. Like Zubiri, Ea Korea often wrote of the theological dimension of this reality, a rather fancy uh, theological word that means the sense in which it is tied back to God and in fact bears not just information about or pointers towards God, but God's very presence. The fact that creation is the life of the Trinity freely expressed in space and time is what lends reality its theological character. In this conviction, Ea Korea also reflects Rahner's emphasis on the presence of grace in the world as the offer of God's free self-giving, breaking down the separation between natural and supernatural. Considered in this light, the inbuilt dynamism of history takes on the quality of transcendence. Ea Korea always specifies that what is at issue is transcendence in, not away from, the world, a position Lee characterizes as an open material realism. Seeking God's relationship with the world is marked by a deepening rather than separating impulse, or in Ignatian parlance, by the call to find God in all things. The human being, then, is the reality animal, whose apprehension of reality is also um, is always also an engagement with the world that carries demands. Because human freedom and intellect are immersed in and anchored by the whole of historical reality, we must not speak of extracting or capturing meaning, but rather, Ea Korea argues, of confronting it. He describes reality with the language of weight, connoting a duty, a burden, or a load, and goes on to explicate three key dimensions of human apprehension on this basis reminding us that we are working with somewhat impoverished translations of the original Spanish terms, which I will not venture to give you, um, Lee renders them in English, first, as realizing the weight of reality, second, shouldering the weight of reality, and third, taking charge of the weight of reality. They constitute, respectively, the noetic, ethical, and practical moments of human being in the world. We will, have cons we will have an occasion to speak more about each in turn. They structure Ea Korea's threefold method for theology and will also serve as the scaffolding for my subsequent remarks on the potential of this theology to speak to the issue of climate change. While Ea Korea is positive about the presence of grace in the world, he is equally conscious of the manifold horrors wrought by sin which in this framework appears as negation 
Like transcendence, sin cannot be spiritualized in an otherworldly fashion. Sin frustrates historical reality's complex dynamisms, which is to say it slams shut openness, thereby foreclosing the actualization of possibilities. Still more pointedly, as a consequence of Aokuria's view of creation, such a condition is a negation of those creatures to whom the God of life gives God's self. Therefore, in Michael Lee's summary, sin is, quote, a personal and social disfiguring of God's presence in history, end quote. Along with other liberation theologians, Ayo Korea is particularly attentive to the role of sinful social structures in negatively conditioning human possibilities, often to the point of death. Such collective exponential instances of wrongdoing frequently display another side of sin as well, namely idolatry, or what he says is the absolutizing and divinizing of a limited creature. In this context, in his context rather, Ayo Korea witnessed against wealth, power, private property, and national security as idols which negated God's loving will by subjecting the majority of El Salvador's people to crushing poverty. Dan's discussion of similar themes in a in the biblical context of Israel has already drawn out a parallel to contemporary climate change by locating the resistance to naming a kind of idolatry of progress and consumerism under the guise of business as usual. His turn to the prophetic imagination as a mode of engaging suffering and sin is also illuminative for Ea Korea's theology. Here I draw our attention to the first dimension of the confrontation with reality recognizing or realizing its weight. We recall that this is the noetic moment, concerned with a committed rather than detached knowledge, since we know that for Ea Korea, concepts do not float free. Noesis entails a historicization of concepts, including theological ones. If it involves discernment of grace, of grace in the world, it is also the case, as Lee puts it, that, quote, naming the sin of the world, accounting for its pernicious effects, and discerning the steps toward a liberation from this sin in its removal from reality represent the other side of realizing the weight of reality, end quote. Ayo Korea often observes that such realizing properly done is prophecy. As with Israel's prophets then, we can also summon Ayo Korea's thick notion of historicized human knowing to say that today, the sin of anthropogenic climate change cries out for salvation. Following from his view of God's transcendence in the world, Ayo Korea insists that we seek after salvation in history, his characteristic adaptation of the more common phrase salvation history. And he frames this as a task of correlation, stating, quote, its essential reference point is the saving work of Jesus, but it must also be a soteriology that historicizes this saving work and historicizes it as the continuation and following of Jesus and his work, end quote. Building from this methodological basis, admittedly dense, and with my apologies, I would like to bring into focus two aspects of Ea Korea's Christology. The first concerns the nature of the saving work of Jesus. Ea Korea affirms creedal and doctrinal claims about Jesus's divinity and humanity, but he finds it imperative to connect these with the historical Jesus. What comes to the fore in the life and ministry of this Jesus, like all human beings immersed in and anchored to reality, is the centrality of the reign of God. To preach and to live toward this vision of peace entails the noetic moment we have discussed, realizing reality's weight as a discernment of, a di of the dialectic between sin and grace. Furthermore, it entails a shouldering of this weight, a decisive ethical option, an act of partiality. Ayo Korea sees the Gospels as shot through with evidence that Jesus presents the arrival of God's gracious reign as a message of good, good news for the poor and the outcast. Carlos Bravo writes, quote, 
Jesus makes three things clear. There is an irreducible opposition between the kingdom and money, the kingdom and prestige, the kingdom and power, end quote. In view of such oppositional forces, which Ea Korea does not hesitate to call the anti-reign or the reign of sin, God's salvation of the poor and outcast takes on the character of liberation. And Jesus, as definitive mediator, can properly be called liberator, as his friend, as Ea Korea's friend and fellow liberation theologian John Sabrino so often did. Given what Ea Korea has already said about historicizing sin, Jesus' entanglement with oppressive socio-political, religious, and economic structures during his public ministry gives concrete content to the gospel as liberation. This reading also invites reconsideration with respect to the traditional claim that Jesus died for our sins. Ea Korea memorably asserted that we must ask not simply the question, why did Jesus die, but rather, why was Jesus killed? In the Gospels, we see that he was executed as a result of his ministry. So, that is to say, he was killed for his committed and personal advocacy of the reign of God, which is a commitment to the liberation of the poor through the removal of the sin of the world. Ea Korea's reading of the ministry and death of Jesus in this manner constitutes one key component of his Christology. A second relates to the fact that, as I mentioned above, a historical soteriology, or historical theory of salvation, must correlate Jesus' saving work to its continuation and following. Lee observes that above and beyond recognizing the centrality of the poor and marginalized in Jesus' mission, Ea Korea explores their broader soteriological significance. Recalling the philosophical theological framework, of God's transcendence in the world, he then advances a theologal concept of the poor. This means for him, quote, the personal and historical reality of human beings, and for this reality, what the living and true God is, and what in reality God wishes to do among human beings and the poor, end quote. Again, he emphasizes poverty as sin and sin as negation, cutting off God's liberating plans and visible presence in history. Specifically, in perceiving the gravity of his contemporary Latin American situation, Ea Korea saw around him what he called a crucified people. This people he defined as, quote, that collective body, which being the majority of humankind, owes its situation of crucifixion to a social order organized and maintained by a minority that exercises its domination through a conjunction of factors, which taken together and given their concrete historical impact must be regarded as sin." End quote. Just as with the killing of Jesus, the circumstances of the contemporary poor's crucifixion call for a causal analysis. Ea Korea pointed to incessant greed, to oppressive capitalism, and to corrupt political processes, summed up as a civilization of wealth, as leading not only to inequality, but to active dis dispossession of the poor's claim to a just and healthy life. In short, he believed that the poor bear the weight of the sin of the world. As such, Ea Korea claimed, they also became what he terms the principle of salvation. For without replacing Jesus' singular significance, the poor participate in and continue Jesus' saving work. Ea Korea draws on the theology of the suffering servant to unpack the paradoxical claim that we are saved through the cross of Jesus. The fate of the world rests with the lowly and the stricken, those who suffer the burden of injustice. As I mentioned earlier, the spiritual pattern of the Ignatian spiritual exercises pervades Ea Korea's theology. This perhaps may be a quality particularly deserving of attention in light of the recent election of a Jesuit pope and interest in his spiritual background. Insofar as Ea Korea considers the poor a theological locus, 
a place from which to do theology, on account of their resemblance to Jesus, he historicizes their soteriological significance through a contemporary adaptation of the first week of the exercises, the meditation at the foot of the cross. Contemplating the crucified people around him, he said, one must ask, quote, what have I done to crucify them? What am I doing in order to uncrucify them? What ought I to do so that this people be raised? End quote. Michael Lee observes that for Ea Korea, this meditation frames the ethical moment of Christian apprehension of historical reality. It reflects a shouldering of that weight by making the option that Jesus made, by making an option for the poor. At this juncture, I want to make more explicit a correlation to the topic of this conference that I hope, maybe, has been hovering behind this short sketch of Ea Korea's Christology. So I ask, might it be possible to see in those persons suffering on account of climate change a crucified people? Might it even be necessary if we take to heart the core insights of Ea Korea's theological method? John Sabrino summarized the outlook of his murdered friend by saying, quote, Ea Korea declared that the great sign of the times, the current presence of God among us, is always the crucified people, the historical continuation of the servant of Yahweh, of Christ crucified, end quote. There is a strong case to be made that a rapidly changing climate, which Dan has previously identified as an anthropogenic sin, conditions Earth's, Earth's reality such that particular communities bear its heaviest burdens. For good reason, the worst effects of climate change are spoken of in the future tense and in global terms. Yet, especially for persons already marginalized by economic and political injustice, the current impact, the impact now, is stifling. Ea Korea's assessment of a dialectical relationship between rich and poor does not invoke a dualistic scheme of guilt and innocence. Rather, it points to the differential allocation of negative climate consequences in a way that I think is eminently applicable to the disproportionate resource use and abuse of wealthy industrialized countries. Perhaps the scale and scope of this problem call for the more variable and plural language of crucified peoples. Perhaps other kinds of extensions and expansions are warranted as well, such as, um, as one example, Sally McFaig's proposal some years ago that, quote, nature is the new poor, end quote. Note, please, that she does not mean that the old poor are no longer deserving of attention. In a similar way, while it is certainly the case that my focus today has been on human suffering, I believe an ecological Christology has much to say about non-human creatures and inanimate creation as well. But without addressing the contentious issue of anthropocentrism in full today, I think at a minimum, we can say that if we are to make an option for the poor, it will be by way of a concerted option for nature's health locally and globally. The value, I believe, of returning to Ea Korea's formative insights regarding liberation and salvation is the profound theological lens it can bring to issues of climate justice. The church must resolutely maintain that God is with the poor and that they are in Christ. So more than a secondary moral claim that comes after faith or a kind of perhaps flimsy environmental addendum, Ea Korea's historical soteriology insists that those who seek Christ must historicize that faith in light of the great sign of the times, which he has said is the crucified people. So if it is, if it is at all convincing that sufferers of climate change bear the weight of the world's sin, Ea Korea would have us insist that they also bear the weight of salvation. This leads, I would argue, to a striking reimagining of how and where we see Jesus as savior. Reflecting on climate change in this way lends a new exigency to the cultivation of a spirituality that would, that would support more informed and responsible action. <clears throat> 
Dan's illumination of the place of mourning and lament in this process is instructive. So too is Michael Lee's thesis on the relationship of soteriology to discipleship in Ea Korea's theology. Ea Korea often wrote that to follow Jesus is to continue the work of Jesus. And again, there's a clever Spanish pun there that I am not able to convey. This suggests, this following and continuation suggests an ecclesial orientation for prayer and praxis shaped around the third dimension of engaging reality, taking charge of that weight. Ea Korea puts it bluntly, quote, any spirituality that does not come from and lead to a praxis that liberates from sin and its consequences does not respond to the life of Jesus, end quote. Realizing the weight of the sin of anthropogenic climate change and shouldering that weight on behalf of the people it crucifies, these two moments are always interwoven with the promise of transformation. Michael Lee states it well. He says, quote, the move from oppression is received as grace, but grows in praxis sustained by hope, end quote. On that note, I would like to conclude with my thanks and turn over the session to Matthew. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, it's an honor to be with you all here today. Um, the title of my presentation is Hope and the Catholic Imagination. Michel Foucault has written that for millennia, man remained what he was for Aristotle, a living animal with the additional capacity for political existence. Modern man is an animal whose politics places his existence as a living being in question. This is eminently the case with the topic before us today, climate change. I think it is evident to all of us how climate change places our existence as living beings in question. I want to argue a point, however, that's perhaps not so evident. Climate change also places our very capacity to think and speak about it in question. Such difficulty derives in part from the extent to which the, po the problem is interwoven with the fabric of our lives. Climate change is, among other things, about the homes we live in, the way we travel, the food we eat, even the clothes we wear. It's therefore not just a problem that is out there. It's very much in here as well. As much as it concerns new and better technologies and policies, mitigating climate change is also about the difficult task of us as individuals, families, and communities unlearning destructive habits. Um, Dan has powerfully reminded us that this is a cause for lament and for repentance. But framing the problem in terms of our destructive habits raises the question what does it mean to see climate change rightly, to get a handle on it, so to speak? Much commentary attends to climate change's external landscapes, rising temperatures, weather patterns and events, glacial retreat, Arctic sea ice loss, changes in vegetation, and so on. Much less commentary, however, focuses on its internal landscapes. In this presentation, I want to concentrate on the correlation between these two landscapes. My contention is that learning to see our situation rightly involves learning to see ourselves rightly. As Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI reminded us in the homily inaugurating his papacy, quote, the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become vast. In other words, to see the ways we damage our earth is to see the ways we damage ourselves as well. I propose surveying some of this damage through the prism of the theological virtue of hope. 
whose object, as Thomas Aquinas puts it, is a future good, namely God, who is difficult but possible to attain, an attainment that only happens when hope leans on God. Following Benedict's 2007 encyclical Spe Salvi, I suggest that reminding ourselves of the church's hope is a helpful way of approaching the problem of climate change and the pathologies of which it is symptomatic. I will argue that we damage our earth and ourselves among other reasons because our hopes are misdirected. And I will consider what it means to hope rightly. So what do I mean by hope? Well, in Space Salvi, Benedict seeks to articulate the hope that the church confesses, which is Jesus Christ, the foundation and fulfillment of the church's hope. In fact, Christ is so determinative of this hope that St. Paul tells the Ephesians that prior to their encounter with Christ, they were without hope in this world. The hope for and given by salvation arrived in Christ. Thus, Paul writes in the letter to the Romans the words that Benedict takes as the title for his encyclical, In Hope We Were Saved. Elizabeth has helpfully reminded us of, an imp of important features of Christology, especially for discipleship in her presentation. Benedict offers a Christology that also bears fruit in discipleship when he comments on the intimate relationship between hope and faith in Christ. In the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the author writes of faith as the substance of things hoped for, the proof of things unseen. Benedict contrasts the substance of this faith with another substance, which the author of Hebrews mentions in the previous chapter when he tells fellow church members, quote, you had compassion on the prisoners and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. There are thus two kinds of substance in view here. The first concerns the property and forms of possession that comprise the ordinary substance of our lives, the substance we typically lean on for our security, the second kind of substance is what the author of Hebrews calls the better and abiding possession that the church members can lead upon even when their property is plundered. While the church's social doctrine has much to say about the first kind of substance, the second kind of substance is what truly sustains her hope. As Benedict puts it, quote, faith gives life a new basis, a new foundation, on which we can stand, one which relativizes the habitual foundation, the reliability of material income. A new freedom is created with regard to this habitual foundation of life, which only appears to be capable of providing support." End quote. Though the church's faith-based hope only appears to offer support, it does indeed offer support which we see especially in the lives that it makes possible. Benedict therefore turns to the martyrs and the habits of renunciation that characterize the great ascetical currents within Christian history in order to illumine this hope. At this point in Benedict's discussion, one might think of those Willis Jenkins calls environmental martyrs. Consider Sister Dorothy Stang, an American-born, naturalized Brazilian citizen who was killed in 2005 in the Amazon basin of Brazil. Her work to protect the forest and those who sought to live from its fruits brought her into conflict with those who wanted to live by clearing the forest for timber and pasture. According to the Pastoral Land Commission of the Catholic Church in Brazil, more than a thousand settlers, union members, and priests who have resisted such clearing have been killed in the past 20 years alone. This story, of course, is not um, sort of limited to Brazil. Beth spoke of those crucified by climate change just a moment ago, but we should also remember those crucified by being, in Pope Francis's words, protectors. In trying to fulfill this mission of protecting, those like Sister Dorothy Stang show us something of the new basis 
the new substance that we can lean upon in faith. Their blood, as Jenkins puts it, is the seed of a reforesting, resisting, replanting, restoring church. Intimately related to the witness of the martyrs, according to Benedict, is the way we see the church's hope in the great acts of renunciation of all those throughout Christian history who have forsaken reliance upon the ordinary substance of life and leave everything behind for the love of Christ, as he puts it. Monasticism is particularly noteworthy in this regard. The renunciation of personal property is, of course, central to monastic asceticism. Against those who see monasteries as places of withdrawal from the world, Benedict points to Bernard of Clairvaux as someone who regards monasteries as offering a vital service to the world and to the church. In their manual and spiritual work, monks prepare the new paradise. And part of this preparation, according to Bernard, is recognition of the correlation between soil and soul, between external and internal landscapes, and the need for work that cultivates both. Monasteries, therefore, are not places of withdrawal, but places that, in the words of Philip Sheldrake, provide a kind of resistance against the diminishment of imagination regarding our hope. They are, um, Sheldrake continues, a not yet here that is beginning to take place, a not yet here that is beginning to take place. Both the external and internal landscapes cultivated in monastic life witness to the hope that makes such cultivation possible. As Spe Salvi proceeds, um, Benedict turns to the distortion of the church's faith-based hope, particular to the modern age. And according to Benedict, um, emblematic of one such distortion is uh, the figure of Francis Bacon and his articulation of a new kind of scientific praxis which privileges practical science in the way it knows nature primarily through controlling it. Bacon is a very complex figure, it seems to me, and it's obviously impossible to do justice to his science and the legacy of that science here, much less Bacon's relationship to inherited traditions of knowledge that he thinks have not only failed him but have failed knowledge itself producing what Bacon calls a fog of despair that obstructs the progress of the sciences. I do want to dwell, however, upon Benedict's observation that one crucial theological implication of Bacon's project is his hope that this new science will restore humankind's dominion over the created order which was lost because of the fall. Um, one of Bacon's work, the new Organon, is saturated with the language of hope. Um, as he writes in the preface, quote, there remains one hope of salvation, one way to good health, that the entire work of the mind be started over again. Or as he puts it later, quote, there is no hope except in the renewal of the sciences. Towards the end of that work, Bacon clarifies the scope of his hope when he writes of the way that Adam and Eve's kingdom over the creatures can be repaired by the new science that Bacon proposes. So rather than prepare for the new paradise, like Bernard's monks, Bacon's hope resides in practical science's power to literally restore paradise on earth. Bacon therefore subtly but unmistakably locates his hope, not in the person and work of Christ, but in a scientific praxis that is imminent in the world. From the vantage of the church's hope, Bacon's project offers nothing short of an alternative scheme of salvation, an alternative soteriology. It is caught up in a dialectic between what are in fact two kinds of hopelessness. First, despair, hopelessness, about what Bacon regards as his worthless intellectual heritage, um, which obscures intellectual progress as such. And another kind of despair, um, another kind of um, hopelessness, namely presumption, in which hope leans not on God, but on the work of human hands. Benedict regards Bacon's project and its distortion of Christian hope as, quote, part of the trajectory of modern times. As Alan Verhey observes, we continue to see the persistence of Bacon's hope 
among other ways, in the ways we often looked first to our sciences and our technologies to remedy our problems, including the problems created by our sciences and technologies. What also makes this distortion part of the trajectory of modern times is its affinities with an attitude that, in the words of Charles Matthews, quote, expects to find all our ends met by and in the world. As Matthews argues, this characteristic attitude of modernity does not result in what Max Weber famously describes as the disenchantment of the world. Rather, as we see quite, quite strikingly in our own time, as human desire increasingly focuses on the consumption of worldly goods, the world actually acquires a new kind of enchantment as our desires are increasingly catechized to want more and different things. The ecological ramifications of this catechesis, of course, are disastrous. For as Matthews observes, quote, waste and the ecological degradation that goes along with it is the ultimate product of our consumer society, its greatest achievement, end quote. According to Benedict, however, none of this should surprise us, for he reads the developments wrought by rampant consumerism as a kind of resistance to human creatureliness, resistance to being dependent upon standards other than those given by humankind itself. Such dependence is understood to be an imposition, a burdensome constraint upon our freedom. From the vantage of the Christian faith, however, the consequences of such resistance can only be damage, and not just to the relationship between human creatures and the creator, but to the relationships between human creatures among themselves and to the rest of the created order. There are also subtler manifestations of the way the world increasingly becomes the locus of our hope. In his fascinating book, Forests, Robert Pogue Harrison provides a particularly striking instance of this. In the world of today, he writes, con conservationists, excuse me, are, quote, often forced to speak the language of those they oppose, what Harrison calls, quote, the language of usefulness. They are forced to remind others that what they seek to conserve provides important ecological services or that it will someday prove useful or beneficial for us. For the moment, Harrison writes, this is the only language that has the right to speak, for it speaks of humanity's economic interests. It remains to be seen whether one day a less compromised, less ironic language will become possible, a language of other rights and other interests, a language, in short, of other worlds." End quote. What I've been trying to suggest so far is that the church's hope offers something, a something like this language. Learning to speak it means learning to see that the world is not the locus of all value and meaning, and we do not find the fulfillment of all our desires in the world. Rather, the world is the location into which our hope enters as the person of Christ, the one who transforms the world by saving it. To catechize our desires towards this hope is to learn to regard the world and ourselves as God's creatures. Perhaps if we hope less from the world than we do, we can learn to place less strain upon it. This presentation has merely scratched the surface of some complex matters, and I'm sure it raises more questions than offers answers. In it, I've simply tried to suggest following Benedict that the church's hope illumines aspects of our present crises that may not at first appear to be evident. It also helps us better appreciate the way that when addressing questions like climate change both before and during his pontificate, Benedict characteristically speaks of the need for new ways of living that are more modest, that consume less, that give more to others. This is precisely because he thinks that the church's hope offers a new basis, a new substance upon which we can lean which relativizes and reorders ordinary forms of possession and property holding. At a meeting with the clergy of the Diocese of Bolzano Bresanone, for instance, Benedict tells those gathered that the most fundamental issue is not devising new technologies or sources of energy, even if doing this is indispensable. None of this will suffice, he warns them, if we ourselves don't find a new way of living 
a discipline of making sacrifices, a discipline of the recognition of others to whom creation belongs as much as it belongs to us who may more readily make use of it, a discipline of responsibility with regard to the future of others and to our own future, end quote. None of this will suffice, we might say, if we do not rediscover the church's hope and the substance in which it is rooted. Thank you. To offer thanks uh, to our three panelists, uh, to Daniel, Elizabeth, and Matthew for their great presentations. Um, also, I might add for the unity of their presentations and how they flowed seamlessly from one to the next. That's uh, a virtue you don't always see in conferences, so very well done. Thank you all. Um, our next order of business, as I understand it, is lunch, uh, which will be served downstairs, um, but not before we thank again our panelists. Thanks.